Well, hello everyone, and great to see everyone coming in. Good numbers today. Uh, this is um, CG seminar webinar stroke 356. Uh, that's a lot. And um, today we look forward to sharing the, another topic in our uh, global academic future of global academic mobility series, international student engagement and support from Lee Tran and Diep Nguyen, who are both from Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. Now, our presenters, Lee Tran, Professor in the School of Education at Deakin University and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow. Um, she was originally a lecturer at Hawaii University prior to coming to Australia doing a very successful PhD and subsequently her academic career has been in Australia, but she retains a strong link back to Vietnam. And she's um, done a lot of work in relation to education in Vietnam, in fact, um, as well as many other things. Um, she's a very productive scholar, um, number of books out and uh, and numerous important journal papers. She's, I have to say, Lee, you are now much cited in the literature. Um, and uh, I think your work has, has been really successful in the last few years. Uh, she's joined by Diep Nguyen, who's a research fellow at the School of Education at Deakin and a project man manager of best practice international student engagement. Diep completed her doctorate on academic capacity building for internationalization of higher education in Australia and Vietnam in late 2021. So quite recently. Um, so hopefully we'll get some flavor, some insight into that doctoral work today. She's working um, on multiple research projects, student mobility, international student engagement, geopolitics and international education all topics of great interest to our participant audience in the webinar. So at this point, really happy to hand over to Lee and Diep. Yep, I can go first. Um, thank you very much, Simon, for uh, the great introduction, and that's a uh, really kind words. Um, and welcome everyone to the webinar today. And thank you for making the time to attend um, the session. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to Say thank you to Simon and the organizers of CGHE for the opportunity for me today. And it's my pleasure today to join uh, Professor Lee Chen, who is the project lead of uh, Best Practice International Student Engagement Project. And I, I, I pass on to Lee. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ziep. Um, yeah, I would like to echo Ziep by saying thank you to Simon and, and Mary um, for inviting us to join the seminar today. And um, a warm welcome to everyone, especially those from Australia who are staying up late with us. And hopefully the insights and information that we share with you um, would be worthwhile for the time. And we look forward to your introduction as well. Now, I would like to pass on to Ziep for the um, overview of the project. Um, thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to check if everyone can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. That's good. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, before we start, I'd like to do the acknowledgement of the country, uh, which is the tradition we're doing here in Australia before uh, every event. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which this presentation is delivered, and pay our respect to the elders past, present, and future. So I'd like to start this presentation first by giving a bit of introduction about the project, and Lee will uh, continue with uh, some uh, research findings. Um, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, Lee and I come from Best Practice International Student Engagement Project. Um, and this project is funded by the Australian government through the International Education Innovation Fund. Um, so the main aims of the project are to, um, number one is to um, identify good practice in international student engagement across a range of areas. And number two is to develop and uh, promote um, the good practice guides and resources uh, to help to you know enhance the international student engagement um, in, in Australia in, and also in the war in general. Um, so the project team includes um, Professor Li Chen, who is a project lead, um, and also other uh, members are Professor Jill Blackmore, uh, Danielle Hartridge, and Associate Professor Helen 
Pops Mute, um, Renata and myself. Um, so the project uh, employs multiple approaches to collect the data and to assist the development of a series of evidence-based good practice guides and resources. Um, this so it's a mixed method. Um, we did desktop analysis in which we analyze existing lit literature and um, good practice examples. And we also did three surveys and um, uh, the data um, as of the 31st of uh, March is that we collected six, more than 6,000 6, responses from uh, participants across the three surveys in which um, you know, more than 3,000 responses are for the International Student Survey. Um, nearly 2,000 is for the graduate survey and nearly 1,000 responses for the stakeholder survey. So apart from this one, we also did um, you know, um, 11 consultation workshops with uh, 213 stakeholders and we did interviews with 40 uh, key stakeholders. So that's mixed method, but within the time frame of the uh, webinar today, we'll be sharing the findings from um, the three surveys. And um, uh, the project is scheduled to conclude in March 2024, 20, uh, 20, uh, which is next year. Okay, um, just a bit of um, you know, information about the demographics of um, participants. So in the um, International Student Survey, we and also graduate survey, the, uh, uh, student, the participants came from across the country in all states, um, but the biggest group of students and, partic and, and, and participating graduates are from three states, um, New South Wales, Victoria, and, and um, Queensland, who, where we have uh, most international students. Um, but we also have international students and graduates uh, from uh, other states as well. Um, in terms of gender, uh, we have a bit more female participants in the International Student Survey uh, with 56% uh, as compared to 43%, um, and the gender is more balanced in the International Graduate Survey. Um, in terms of um, stakeholder participants, they come from across you know, um, a variety of organizations um, across education sector, uh, including school, higher education, vocational and pathway sectors. Um, and we also receive responses from participants in student association or youth association, profession, uh, professional organizations, and the stigma, the um, governments at different levels and other stakeholders as well. So um, we are happy to see you know, diverse perspectives from um, different group of stakeholders. Um, yep, so in the um, survey, we asked um, the participants to share their view on the areas um, that international students need support. And um, uh, this uh, table um, presents, you know, the most chosen one, uh, the most chosen areas, which are the top areas where they think international students need support the most. Um, and uh, the data is quite similar for international students and international graduates, where they indicate that finding jobs, um, career orientation and employability, and work integrated learning uh, being the top three factors in, um, in both surveys, um, which is followed by um, employment related concerns and financial issues for international students, and employment related concerns and connection with domestic students and dealing with crisis for international graduates. Um, this is a bit different for the, in, the education providers and stakeholder uh, survey though, um, where they think into English language skills and face-to-face -face learning and adjusting to teaching and learning approaches um, are the top areas where international students need support the most. Um, so apart from asking um, the question about uh, you know, their views on how on the areas where international students need support. We also ask well, which area that international students have actually sought support from, um, you know, different um, uh, support uh, providers. And um, the findings is that it is quite in line with um, the, the, the responses in the previous questions where international students and, and graduates uh, think that uh, indicated that they actually sought support from, um, you know, uh, for the, Three top areas are finding jobs, career orientation and employability, and uh, work integrated learning or internships. Um, yeah, and um, 
in uh, terms of uh, ed education providers and stakeholders, they also indicated the English language skills being the top area where international students uh, sought support, but that was followed by accommodation and face-to-face -face learning and finding jobs and dealing with uh, the impacts of the crisis. Um, this, um, this two pie charts um, um, represents um, the percentage of in, you know, international students and international graduates um, indicating whether they actually sought help uh, when they um, had any problems or, or they uh, faced any challenges. Um, so the data is quite interesting here. So although uh, the majority of students and graduates um, indicated that they actually sought help when they experienced problems, um, with 66% of international students participants indicating so, uh, as compared to 80%. Um, but we found that the percentage of the uh, participants who indicated that they did not report at all or they did not seek help at all is quite um, significant with an eight, a 19% of international students indicating so uh, as compared to 14% uh, um, graduates. Um, so it is quite interesting because uh, we can see the difference over the time, um, that over the time up to the point that they are, you know, graduating um, the percentages of uh, intern of uh, participants indicating they do uh, report the problems um, is increasing. So uh, this indicates that you know over the time they may have more information and they may know better uh, about the process. And um, now I will pass on to Lee, who could continue to speak speak about the reasons for um, the students indicating not seeking help and why um, they do so. Thank you. Thank you, Zia, for an excellent overview of the project and sharing some of the insights about um, seeking help and areas that international students actually should have or needed help. Um, for the current slide, we would like to share some findings um, regarding the main reason why participating international students and graduates did not seek support or report exploitation, uh, misconduct, or um, make a complaint, um, whether at the university or in the workplace or in relation to accommodation. And as you indicated earlier, a significant number of international students, um, up to 19% didn't seek help or report problems that they encountered. And um, for both international students and international graduates, the um, most cited reason is that they did not know the process. Um, so that have significant implication because it means that enhancing international student capacity to um, understand the process of seeking help or reporting misconduct or exploitation or their problems is a critical part. And for international students, um, the number two reason for not seeking help or reporting problem is did not know how to articulate the problem. Um, and that is followed by being unaware of the um, support that is available. Um, and that is followed by being unaware of um, on did not want to get into trouble. For instance, if they face exploitation in the workplace um, and they work over hours, for instance, and they're worried about um, their visa may be canceled if they report the, the problem um, in relation to their employers or um, they may get into trouble by you know um, being sacked by, by their, their employer. And uh, number five reason is the fear that um, their request will be re rejected. And for international graduates, um, the number one reason is the same at e international students. Um, but I would like to note that, um, again that the survey for international graduates asked them to reflect on their time um, being an international student. So the experience that they reported here is the international student experience um, that they reflected back. 
Um, so number two reason is being unaware that support could be available. It's quite similar to international student survey. Um, and then um, did not want to get into trouble. Um, but number four reason is related to a lack of trust. Um, they don't believe that if they report the problem, um, there is anything that could be done about that. And number five is uh, the fear of um, being discriminated. Okay, so can we move to the next slide? Yep. Yes, Lee, can you see the next slide? The next slide on most area needed and used as support sources. Okay. We can see it. Yeah. Okay, excellent. I can see that. Um, so um, one of the key questions in our survey is um, the top support sources needed and actually used by international students. Um, so for offshore support, you can see that um, the support from families at home um, is the um, most needed and most used by international students. So support from their parents and, and um, family at home. And um, for onshore support, clearly that followed by support from their teachers and, and lecturers for both groups. Um, and then that followed by support from international student friends um, from other countries. And um, then number four is the support services provided by their institution, including um, work integrated learning and employment support, um, mental health and well-being support, accommodation support, uh, intercultural communication and language support. Um, and then for international student that is followed by the support from their domestic friends or code national friends. And for, um, in, for international graduates, when they reflect it back, um, the support that a num number five source of um, most needed and most used by them is support from their co-national friends. Um, this is really important. And I think it um, a good reminder that um, you know, for international students, clearly um, they spend a lot of time with their teachers, especially um, for um, school students. And um, remember that for our survey, we not only look at international students in higher education, but also in the school sector from primary to secondary um, level, in the pathway and foundation study sector, in the ALICO sector, which is um, English for overseas student sector, but also in the vocational education sector. So clearly um, onshore support that they use mode is their teachers and they turn to their teachers not only for support and help with teaching and learning but also for mental health and well-being for advice about career orientation and work integrated learning um, and also advice about their um, mental health and well-being and accommodation okay um for the next part of the survey we um, look at international student level of engagement um, where we focus on their engagement or connection with their employers, with their workplace, um, with local communities, with domestic peers, with um, international student friends from other country, with um, co-national friends and um, institution community and their teachers and whether they feel welcome in Australia. And um, from the the, the the figure here, we can see that domestic students were the group that participating, participating international students felt disconnected the most, um, which is really a sad thing because connecting with domestic students is really important and desirable for most international students who come to study in a host country. But in reality, not just um, the findings of this survey, but other research that we we engage um, before reinforce that um, one of the most disappointing part of their overseas study um, is the lack of connection with domestic peers, and that really affects their sense of belonging and and sense of being welcome in Australia. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. Okay. And uh, now we would like to um, look quickly into who should provide information on international student rights. Um, so at international students who cross border to study in another country, clearly they are entitled to rights at um, customer or consumers of education services, but also their rights at tenants um, in accommodation space, at workers in the workplace, and also at human beings um, who, who live and study in a country that um, they don't have citizenship, but they are entitled to um, basic human rights. And the two most um, chosen option in the three surveys are education providers and the government um, where international student, international graduates and um, provider and stakeholder um, agree that um, their institution and the government should be the um, those who are responsible for providing information on their, their rights. But for international students, clearly um, they, they think that um, the information about their rights should uh, come from the government, around 19% of them uh, think so, and that followed by their institution, while for um, international graduates, they think that um, information from their rights should equally come from their institution and the government. Um, the next slide will um, look at who should provide guidance on help seeking and complaints making, um, which is very, very interesting because if we link back to the previous slide on the finding, we see that international students think that information about their rights should come from the government first and then followed by their institution. But um, with regard to the provision of guidance, um, about how to seek help and how to make a complaint, they thought that the institution should be more responsible for that and that followed by the government. Um, and um, similarly, international student credits um, seem to echo with um, the perception of international students. Um, and that also matches with the, the finding from education provider and stakeholder survey. Okay, um, on the next slide, um, we look at whether education provider should be allowed to provide advice on post-study work visa. Um, so for, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Australian uh, context, um, post-study work visa, um, has been seen at a draw cat for Australian institutions to attract international students. So in a way, post-study work rights policy um, is a sign of destination attraction for, um, for Australia. And the nexus between study, post-study work rights and migration due to be quite sensitive um, but it is becoming more and more, um, people are becoming more and more open to talk about that nexus um, over the past year in, in Australia. But um, by law, education providers are not allowed to provide advice on visas and migration because um, post-study work visa and migration are so closely related. So it become quite sensitive that um, education providers are not uh, allowed um, to provide advice. But it's really hard um, for, to talk about um, delivering on promise and the outcome of international student experience without talking about post-study work rise um, and the pathway from study to work in the Australian context or in their home country and the pathway to migration. So um, that has become you know, clearly a reality in Australia now. Um, so in a way, international students really want information about post-study work visa to be provided by their institution, um, as you can see here. Um, 
Okay. The next one is the um, um, working hour cap. Um, so in um, July this year, the, the government um, will be announcing a major policy change um, in terms of working hour cap. That means there would be work hour restriction again um, on international students. So at the moment, um, international students can um, work at many hours as they want, and there is no cap on the number of working hours for them. Um, and in our survey, we, we asked the question, you know, whether there should be no limit on work hours or, um, you know, there's different options on the limits. So you can see that the um, majority of international students, international graduates and stakeholders think that it is important to put the cap back um, so that means it is important to have some restriction on working hours. But um, for international students, the option of having 40 hours per fortnight um, is a more chosen um, option. And, um, and that is followed by um, 30 hours per fortnight. For international graduates, um, they think that um, either 40 hours per fortnight or 30 hours per fortnight um, or 40 hours per fortnight or 30 hours per fortnight are the most um, are the two most chosen um, options and for um, provider survey you can see that providers um, and stakeholder are on a more protect these sites. They think that 30 hours per fortnight should be reasonable. And that is followed by um, 20 hours per fortnight. So that we can see a more uh, cautious sign here um, from the education providers and, and stakeholder perspective. And um, as Yip indicated earlier, we also did in-depth interview with 40 stakeholders. Um, and one of the key questions in that interview is, you know, whether the working hour cap should be back or not, and um, why and, and, and why not. And clearly the majority um, of participants echoes um, the key findings here, which is um, it is the right policy to have the working hour cap back. And the main reasons for having the working hour cap back is that um, international students should prioritize their study. Um, because they are here in Australia to study, not not to work, and um, work hours visa um, should not undermine um, the main purpose of international education, which is to study. And the second reason is that having the restriction on working hour will um, allow international students to keep a balance between study work and their life. And the third reason is that um, the, the, the impact on not having work hour caps on international student study and life is so significant and um, is so um, negative um, that the, the cost is so big um, and have, um, you know, negative impact not only on their study but also their health and well-being and and their finance if they fail cost because of overworking um, they have to pay fee um, again which is extremely expensive and the other reason is that um, international students especially undergraduate students may not be very good at time management and the regulation about work our cap will will have them to refocus on their study. Um, and the other reason is that um, if the policy allow no cap, a lot of parents would expect their 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 children to work more and to subsidize their study. Um, the final reason that has been pointed out during the interview is that international students may be vulnerable to exploitation if there is no work hour cap because employers will ask them to do more shifts and it's very hard for them to decline employer requests. Um, yes, so um, I just wrap up my presentation with a, a couple of um, 
main findings um, in about two minutes. And um, the other aspect of the survey that we look at is around the challenges for providers in providing support for international students. Um, so education providers think that the top challenging area for support provision is um, helping international students in English language skills, which is consistent with the finding that Yip shared earlier, where um, education providers think that the most needed area for support for international students is English language skills. And that is followed by um, how to help them deal with racism and discrimination. Um, the number three areas um, that appear to be quite challenging for providers in supporting international students is around mental health and well-being, finding jobs, adjusting to teaching and learning, and um, again, employment-related concerns. Just the final slide, I believe. Um, we also look at professional development and capacity building for staff involved in supporting international student engagement. And the data has indicated that the most common form of professional development for staff involved in working with international students is a community of practice where a group of uh, staff and teachers come together and share common interests and common concerns, sharing tips and strategy in supporting international students. And that is followed by info, informal professional development activities by the staff themselves. So they organize the informal PD um, out of their own initiative. Um, and number three is formal professional development activity provided by their own organization. And that is followed by um, the formal PD activities that is provided by external organization. For instance, they um, invited experts um, you know, to come um, and provide guidance about how to um, support international students in terms of um, dealing with mental health and, and well-being, or uh, invited um, um, the police to come to talk about scam, um, and how to support students who deal with um, scam, for instance. Okay, so with that, um, I would like to wrap up our, um, our presentation. Um, so we really appreciate your listening and we um, would welcome any feedback, input or questions from you. Thank you. And thank you. Um, thank you both, Jeff and Lee. Uh, and what this shows to me is, is how powerful it is when we present survey type data, simple data um, divided into a few categories on, on a slide. And it's about important questions, important issues. That's a really effective way of discussing issues. And, and it's a really, you know, a good form of communicative social science, I think. And so simple. Um, uh, and you've raised so many important issues today. I, I thought that, you know, and that when we see the difference between the different categories or questions you're asking or responses we're getting, you know, those differences immediately tell us quite a lot, don't they? Um, I thought the, the finding on sense of belonging being relatively low, despite the fact that, you know, majority of people were connecting in lots of ways and were generally positive about, most people are generally positive with this category of people who are not, who are having a bad experience. But the actual sense of belonging was one of the lowest, uh, you know, recorded things. And um, I was really, so that was worrying and, and not surprising, but, you know, a lot of concern, really. You think of the human lives involved. And uh, uh, I was very encouraged by, to see that support from other international students is such a good factor for so many people. You know, these communities that form of people from different countries, and they support each other well. And often people get more support from other international students than they're getting from their own compatriots. But that depends on how many, of course. So if you've got a big Chinese student population, people are going to spend a lot more time with their own uh, national colleagues than, say, if you're coming from, uh, from Bhutan. You know, there won't be many Bhutanese students around, so you'll get to know other students more readily. So it depends a bit on the group. But um, I, it's just really great that cosmopolitanism does really work in as a as a practical thing. This is a really, you know, one of the things we hope from international education. And 
Of course, it doesn't work in relation to the relationships between local students and international students. We also we know that this is a persistent problem. It's very difficult to to make forward progress on this, and there are some cases where schemes and and programs do succeed. Um, I was going to uh, though quickly. My first questions are now coming in, but I'll ask my question. Um, I was really interested in the migration and international student problems, and particularly the kind of sensitivity of migration in Australia at the moment. Notice there was a recent um, uh, survey of different countries and their attitudes to immigration uh, published in The Guardian last week. And what it showed was Australia is registering more opposition to immigration than the other Anglophone countries at the moment. This really fluctuates. So the UK is low in its opposition to migration at the moment. And yet go back 10 years and it was a hot button, you know, near right issue that everyone was opposing immigration in great numbers, but it's changed through it's it's flipped, turned right around as it does with migration. You know, immigration issues are very volatile in countries. And at the moment, Australia's had low resistance to migration for long periods. Now it seems to be fairly high um, in historical sense. So there is, you can see why it's a sensitive issue. My question is what happens? to international student graduates in Australia who, who need to do some work experience as part of their professional, you know, programs such as, um, you know, lawyers and, and, and doctors and, and others who, you know, to get the qualification, it, it's often mandatory to do a period of apprenticeship indenture, you know, a period where you're actually working, you know, in the industry concern, in the role concern. Um, and yet that's, it might be after your course is finished. Um, what happens to those students? Thank you, Simon. That that's really a critical question. Um, so for for those who work in um, or graduate from professional programs um, like engineers and 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 doctors, um, for instance, um, there quite significant barriers to get their um, qualification being recognized by the employers and, and get a job in their field of study in, in Australia. Um, despite um, skill shortage um, and, you know, the, the um, rhetoric about um, the need to recruit international graduates to fill out skill shortage and to um, help with the country's um, economy at the moment. And I think um, the significant barrier is the mismatch between policy intention and the reality of the labor market in those profession. Apart from IT, um, where international graduates in those fields are more likely to secure a job in their field of study due to the demand um, in the IT profession and the availability of contract jobs and also um, the background of managers in IT who are often from international background and the tradition in IT which um, favor the outsourcing of jobs um, where international students can, can have some competitive advantage. In other um, professions, um, including engineering and accounting, um, it is very difficult for them to secure a job in their field of study, even the current time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the intention of the post-study work right policy is for international students and graduates to stay on for a period and um, gain some professional experience in their field and secure a job in, in, in their field. But the reality of the labor market is that a lot of employers have no idea about what a post-study work visa is or the 4A5 visa is. So there is a lack of understanding and sympathy uh, sympathy from employers for international creditors. And the second reason is that the, the notion of best fit still um, or cultural fit is still very strong in, in some professional organization in Australia. So they would like to recruit someone with similar mindset and you know um, 
who can speak English as a native speaker, and um, you know, he who can behave um, the way that they expect um, at a traditional or conventional norm. Um, so that is really a significant area. Um, the other barriers um, I just want to succinctly mention is the situation of cash 22 or chicken or egg situation. So basically, with our PR permanent residency, it is very difficult for you to secure a job in your field of study um, in, in Australia because a lot of employers that I indicated earlier are unaware of um, the post-study work rights policy and how easy it might be to recruit international students, why they prefer someone with citizenship or permanent residency. But with our permanent residency, um, you know, it, it's very hard for international graduates to secure a job, but with our having a job, it's very difficult for them to secure permanent residency because you don't have enough points. Um, but the Minister of Migration mentioned, you know, um, there would be changes in migration policy in the coming months where they can fast track um, or make it easier for international graduates in some um, area of um, study um, in area of skill shortage to gain permanent re residency more quickly. So I hope that it would be a license for them um, to apply for a job in their field of study. Thank you. Yes, and all of this shows that it's complex and information is important. And all of this shows that not to being able to talk about it at institutions is a real problem for everyone because it means the information flow is worse uh, it means the advice is, is going to be limited and held back and so on. So, I mean, we, it just should be possible for everyone to discuss this kind of issue properly in, in any setting, um, because it's clearly of great importance to many people and the country as a whole. So I do hope that prohibition is lifted. Um, well, we've got great um, interest in the chat. I, mean, I think everyone held back because they wanted to hear what you were going to say. And then at the end, they started flooding in. So we're going to bring in Alison Leslie first. Alison. Hello. Uh, yeah, thank you. Really, really interesting. Um, it's very similar to a project I'm working on here in the UK um, with uh, a much, much smaller project uh, just with students in two schools. Um, so I was particularly interested in the questions you were asking because they're very similar to questions we're asking our students. And I wondered in particular with regards to um, the reasons given for not seeking support were those um, options that you gave them to select from, or were those was that an open ended question where they could just give any reasons um, they had? It's a really good question. Those are the options that um, we gave them to select, and as Yip indicated earlier, we did a big desktop analysis where we review literature in the field and we um, synthesize those reasons, but we also put other for them um, so that, you know, if they have a different reason, they can point it out for it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alison. Um, and, and I must say the, the situation in the UK and Australia is similar enough to mean that researchers across the two countries should be talking to each other a lot more than they do. I've been quite surprised by the, in fact, that um, the international education researchers in the UK don't cite the Australian literature very much, except your work Lee, is recognised quite widely. But um, and 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 to some extent, I think the Australian conversation also works separately and on its own. So and we, everyone should be talking to each other more, obviously. Um, next, that's week, why we need your um, webinar more and more, Simon. Good. Um, well, this is partly what we try to try and you know break down the barriers and. Bring everyone into a single conversation around an issue, I think it can make a difference. Um, Jorge, Jorge, Enrique, uh, Delgado, can you come in, please? Yes, thank, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for this uh, presentation, Lee, very interesting. So I'm from the University of Pittsburgh and CIS, the Comparative and International Education Society. So my question is, uh, is, is uh, I, it's very interesting. Your topic is very interesting. And one of the things that I would like to see or to learn from your experiences, either country-wise or institutional-wise. Um, so if there is some so one of the things, one of the perspectives that you can use to see uh, 
uh, have international students is, for example, training a, a highly specialized uh, workers. So what is the interest in the, con in, in the country to stay, to keep them, people who they train uh, very, very specialized in high levels, or if they just, do you see that they are more interested in having customers coming to study and they can go move forward to do whatever they want? So how do you see that? Or what do you see over there? I can see um, policy change in, in that area. Um, so before, um, prior to um, 2020, um, there, there is sort of um, forbidden talk about um, retaining um, international students um, at migrants. So sort of, um, you know, it's very sensitive to talk about the direct pathway or the nexus between international education and migration. But, um, you know, the, the, the the pandemic and also recently um, the conversation has changed. Um, the country and the sector have been more open um, in talking about tapping on international graduates, uh, especially in the areas of skill shortage or specialized areas at important human resources to tackle skill shortage in Australia. Um, to help to respond to the needs of the labor market in, in some areas. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there has been indication that about policy change that facilitate the pathway from international education to migration for graduates um, in certain areas of skill shortage. Thank you. Thank you both. Um... Look, can we bring in Mika Tamura next? But I think what we'll do, Lee, because we're running out of time a bit, we've got about 10 minutes to go. We'll have two questions now together. And you, if you could so say, hold your answer to Mika until you've also heard from Mariam uh, Kilanava. And uh, so we'll have both questions, but somewhat different questions, uh, and you can respond to them together. Uh, um, Mika, please come in. Oh. Hello, um, I'm from Japan and I'm like personally very curious that like when you say international students in Australia, I imagine that you know students are coming from all different you know countries and they have different culture backgrounds. And so like uh, when I think about you know uh, their background, uh, like how you know does it affect uh, the students at adapt adaptation to higher education in Australia and also, um, uh, their like a uh, success uh, in their study, and another thing is uh, how does your institute or like uh, other Australian institutes deal with that like um the culture differences and student success? Okay, yeah. thank you, Mika. Sure. Good question, of course. And hold hold your answer, uh, Lynn Diep. Can we bring in Mariam? Mariam uh, Kulanava, are you there, please? Hello, Mariam. Hello, everyone. Well, I'm sorry I cannot turn on the video camera right now because I don't it's have okay. a good, good background right now. Okay, so as far as um, I'm going to conduct a um, survey uh, in this field also in Georgia because we have got many international students here. So I would like to know whether the method that you used while doing the survey, did it give you the results you expected or would you change it in the future? So I mean the uh, poorly technically if it gave you the results you wanted or what would you change in the future so thank you, you would you like to answer it mm -hmm. um yes um thank you mariam and thank you mika um yeah to respond to the to the question from uh, mariam so um yeah in um as i presented earlier we did the uh, three um big source of data. First one is desktop analysis and then the next one is um, survey and, and another source is uh, from uh, quanti qualitative data from uh, consultation workshops and, and interviews. So the data we, we got back is, is very rich and um, some of the findings we uh, received is um, actually the confirmation of what we found out from um, the desktop analysis, um, but uh, also we received a lot of new ones 
um, type of uh, information, um, the, especially through the open-ended questions in the surveys and also from um, the interviews and consultation workshops where they, uh, there, are, there are lots of recommendations coming from uh, stakeholders as well as graduates and international students. Yep, thank you. And I would like to add to what Yip said. Um, for the three surveys, we got 150,000 words of um, response to open-ended questions. So that's, that is another very big set of data that we haven't got a chance to analyze. Thank you so much. Okay, both questions satisfactorily dealt with, I hope colleagues. Um, next, can we bring in Chris Longman, please? Hi, hello, um, hope you can hear me. Thanks very much for that presentation. Now, um, one thing that surprised me a little bit was that how much emphasis there was on employment related uh, support um, that students seem to require or want. Um, as opposed to more pedagogical support about adapting to a different culture of, of learning and teaching. Now, my experience here at Lancaster University in the UK and, and Exeter University prior to that is that students are very concerned, especially at the start of their studies, with a different set of expectations, to teaching and learning expectations, and they, they really do want to adapt to this as well as English language support, they want pedagogical you know, uh, learning support. So it interested me that there just seemed to be a far more emphasis in your study on the employment related things where you know, when we have large numbers of Chinese students here in Lancaster, I don't believe that we give a lot of support in finding a job back in China for them. Um, so it'd be surprising if they were you know, seeking that support. So I'm just wondering whether you have any thoughts on this, thanks. Yeah. Before you respond, uh, let's bring in another question, one from Louise Staunton, and then maybe you can deal with them both together. Louise. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, yes, I have a very specific question. Um, so arising from your research, uh, Diepa and Lee, what types of resources are you planning to produce from these from this project if it isn't too early to ask that question? Um, and also then will these resources be aimed mainly at students or also at education providers? I'd love to hear a little bit about what you're anticipating. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Oh, wonderful question. I let you to answer Louise's question first because that is a, a significant component of the project. Yeah. Thanks, Louise, for asking that question. That is also uh, what we are working at the moment. And that is one of the big aims of the project is to produce a good practice um, guides and resources. So um, that is a suite of different resources that we are producing at the moment. We are aiming to produce, um, to develop the guides uh, for different you know, targeted audience. Um, and we separate them into, into themes. Um, so we have identified uh, eight big themes, a, which are the areas of support um, um, for, for international student engagement, uh, for example, uh, teaching and learning and mental health and well-being, uh, you know, um, uh, two examples of those um, areas. Um, so we are developing the, the guides as six and eight, eight separate guides on eight separate um, themes and another one, you know, uh, holistic guides and, uh, and another one for international student only. So there will be a set of 10 guides all together in that, um, in that um, resources um, and also besides from the other guys we also developed the virtual map which is the directory of all the good practice um, programs and uh, support services for international students where international students can get access to so um, and we also do you know for example the video for case studies to illustrate um, what good practice uh, will look like in the in the sector yeah thank you for that question that's wonderful that's great. And we hope that um, Simon and the center will let us do another webinar to, to launch the suite of um, 10 guys and, and resources in a couple of months. <laughs> Thank you. And, and to your question, Chris, um, indeed, it's one of the striking finding of the survey where we see the um, mismatch in the perception of um, what international st uh, student and graduates see at um, the area that they need support the most and they actually short support the most um, without related to finding a job, um, 
career orientation and employment support and um, work integrated learning and internship compared to um, providers and stakeholder perception that the area that international needs support the most um, are around English language skill and um, teaching and learning approaches. And um, the, the, it is quite um, distinctive in, in Australia because the, the um, discord about um, employability and employment outcomes um, are, are you know, very, very dominant uh, when talking about graduate outcomes and um, finding job that is mentioned in the survey by the student and graduates is not just finding job after you have already graduated from university or vet or school, but finding a casual and part-time job during your study to um, help with um, you know, um, living costs during your study in Australia. So that, that kind of um, finding job and career support and you know, preparing um, your CV or preparing for, for interview for a casual job um, um, is often quite um, in high demand um, by, by the students. And when we did the desktop survey, we um, review assisting resources um, of support. And, and clearly, um, we have come up with over 100 career support services for international students in Australia compared to, um, you know, dozen in teaching and learning um, at the national level or in terms of mental health and well-being and, and accommodation, for instance. So we can see that um, there is significant um, resources available to support international students with job seeking and employability. Um, but one of the key important thing to note here is that those support services are from both their institution as well as from organization outside the education sector, for instance, community organization, or um, third party providers or professional organization who is involved in um, providing um, career support for newcomers to Australia or for uh, refugees or for new migrants and international students also utilize those resources. And um, the combination of on-campus support and external support has made career support and employ employability support really stand out compared to the other area of support in it. Yep. And Thank you. Chris's reflection is comparing that to the UK. Um, and it is different, this whole ideology about the relationship between education, international education and migration is different in the two countries. The way it works out politically is different. Um, and I mean, in Australia, you've got a situation where quite a large proportion of international student graduates have become permanent residents and migrants, often long-term. And the, no, I've never been able to get a really clear figure on that, but it's roughly 30% over the 30 years of the international student program. So it's somewhere in that ballpark, slightly less than a third, I think seems to be about right. And that's a lot. Now in the UK, of course, international education can be a migration pathway too. And um, some of course want to use it that way, minority. Um, and, and, and the post-study work visa has a migration meaning as well as a let's, let's find a way to help international graduates earn, earn, earn the money to pay back their loans, which is the other meaning it has. Um, but the ideology in the UK is always to pretend that there's no relationship between international education and its policy on one hand and migration policy on the other. So I remember appearing before the House of Lords Committee on Higher Education a few years ago with two vice chancellors with me. And at the very end of the session saying, look, people say there's no link between migration and international education, but there's actually a massive link. Uh, and, you know, and then I talked about it. And then immediately Ed Byrne, who was then the um, Vice Chancellor of, of the Principal of King's College London jumped up and said, "No, no, no, he's wrong. There's no relationship between the two. And you know, it's 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 that's how the sensitivity has been managed in the UK. You know, to pretend they're completely different things. Whereas in Australia, it's this on-off again conversation. You know, you you can have. So you know, I think we should all be more blunt and frank about the whole thing. But um, I mean, of course, there's a relationship, but it's not the only thing that happens with international education." It's probably not even the most important single aspect, the migration aspect 
Um, but uh, but it is there. It is important. And I guess the other thing is that Australia is a bit closer to the zones where many international students are going back to, you know, employment wise. I mean, it's closer to Vietnam, it's closer to China. Uh, and, and, and you know, the UK is a long way away from in East Asia and labour markets in the East Asian, Southeast Asian region are a very remote thing in people's minds. Um, Europe labour markets are more, you know, evident to them. So there is that factor as well. But yeah, it's funny how these similar countries can have a different political culture around such a crucial issue, but and people are affected by that. Look, thank you, um, Yep, and, and, and Lee, thank you very much. Um, you are welcome to come back and talk again about your study. You can see how many people are interested today, what good questions we got and good comments in the chat and good attendance. So I'm sure, you know, everyone will really welcome you back again. Um, thank you for presenting so well too. I think that you brought the issues alive for us in a really effective way. And thanks, Jeff. I thought you presented really, really well with great confidence. And, you know, I mean, I think that's tremendous that you're active in the research domain in, in the area. And you're going to make a Thank you so much, contribution. Simon. Yeah, it was great. Um, now, next uh, webinar is on Thursday. And we've got, we're still in, in the future of academic mobility. Um, and uh, and we've got uh, Polina Ivanova. Now, Polina is a, a student who originally from Russia who's a postdoctoral researcher now, and she's uh, at Ritz-Mersen American University in Kyoto in Japan. Um, and she's going to talk to us about this relationship between international education, migration, and civil society, and how um, you know international students experience uh, civil society in the country of education. So there's a really important, you know, issue for us that touches on many of the issues raised today. So we look forward to Paulina's uh, presentation in two days' time. Until then, uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you all for participating in the discussion. Thank you very much again to our two excellent presenters and uh, look forward to seeing you soon and bye for now. Bye. Thank, thank you, you Simon and everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.